gender equality. But one question that comes to us is why do we even do this at the regional and international level when changes actually occur at national levels? So uh, our response to that is having improved regional and international norms and standards around sexual and reproductive health and rights, that gives a benchmark and upper standard uh, for at the national level for countries to uh, draw upon those progressive uh, recommendations or progressive outcomes as such. So uh, that's one of the reasons. And um, uh, if you look at sexual and reproductive health and rights and accountability mechanisms around that, uh, a, at the regional level, you have the uh, Asia-Pacific Population Conference. So that's one of the conferences that actually is held once in a decade. And in 2013, the sixth Asia-Pacific Population Conference was held where issues of sexual and reproductive health and rights, population dynamics were discussed by the member states. And uh, there was a very recent midterm review of the Asia-Pacific Population Conference. And that's where um, a monitoring framework is actually being developed, which the member states are agreeing to uh, put in place and uh, present their reports uh, on a periodic basis of how their respective countries are faring. So that's one mechanism, which is the APPC, um, the ministerial declar uh, declaration. Uh, the second framework is, of course, the SDG agenda that we are all talking about. And uh, SDG agenda has the annual follow-up and review mechanism every year that happens at the global level, which is the HLPF, which is the high-level political forum. But having said that, at the regional level, we have the Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, which is the regional follow-up and review mechanism. And uh, uh, the way this whole SDG agenda is being followed up and is being reviewed, uh, although on a very voluntary basis, because countries um, are not uh, obligated as such by the SDG agenda. Um, uh, so there are voluntary reports that actually come up, and uh, there are discussions that actually happen uh, at the intergovernmental level, but also the CSOs and the civil, uh, young people and all the different stakeholders engage uh, in order to have positive outcomes. So that's the landscape at the regional level uh, around sexual and reproductive health and rights. I think, you know, uh, even as we talk about these mechanisms, many of them robust mechanisms, I think it's really, I feel this year again seems to be almost like that turning point or milestone moment for us. And I can see many senior colleagues in the room who will remember 1994 and 95 and the turning point that symbolized uh, in terms of ICPD and Beijing. And here we are 25 years later, wondering how all that dissipated and how that political momentum or commitment that we as civil society movements and governments kind of uh, could generate uh, seems to be in some ways lost. And I think caught in that, uh, in that whole politics of what we have lost, I think at the heart of that is very much issues around sexual and reproductive health and rights. And it's ironical, really, because here we are again almost, it seems like we are working with the building blocks of SRHR, where we should have been talking about progressing to the next level of, uh, of those sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, and, and really thinking about both backlash and how do we even hold the line on those gains 25 years back. So I think it's important as we reflect on, on our role on accountability mechanisms that we are really in a very fraught and challenging situation. Uh, and uh, so that's one point I really wanted to make. What does CREA do or has done vis-a-vis -vis accountability mechanisms and why am I here as part of this panel? Uh, I think one, two things we've tried to do in the last two decades that we've existed. One is really embedding ourselves deeply within certain mechanisms. So for example, CREA has been part of an initiative called the Sexual Rights Initiative that primarily works with the UN Human Rights Council. So I talked about the Universal Periodic Review. And our agenda was twofold. One was really within these global human rights mechanisms, how do we centrally address issues of sexuality and SRHR? I think they're extremely, we never found a place at the table. And that needs a number of things uh, in terms of access, in terms of representation, because I think those deep exclusions continue 
We are beginning to see that play out in the way the plus 25 processes are working. So that battle is still not won. So I think accountability mechanisms uh, can serve a number of purposes. But most importantly, I think these fundamental principles need to be core to what we do. Uh, on, on these uh, 51 indicators, these countries have been ranked. And it is giving us one uh, opportunity to actually generate conversation around where are the countries if we look at SDG progress from a gender equality lens. So I think that is what uh, uh, we actually, that idea clicked with us. Also, we are trying to localize SDGs. So, and I think uh, I totally agree with Sara what she said in the morning plenary, that uh, there is a certain kind of legitimacy given only to evidence which is coming out from maybe the quantitative domain or the kind of reports government is producing. So we had this very clear that the evidence which is generated from the ground level, the organizations who are working with the communities and the kind of knowledge they have about what's happening with the larger, uh, like the policies and programs which are getting implemented at the field, I think it's our responsibility to actually put it together. So uh, the way we tried to actually localize SDGs was uh, with uh, we generated state reports using the quantitative data which government had. So just looking at the goal three and goal five and the focus was on SRH. So we took these reports to the state levels and uh, we had these consultations with the civil society organizations. And I think the collaborative work we are doing with common health organizations like Common Health or Vada uh, uh, organization or Jan Swasti Abhiyan, I think that gave us uh, opportunity to actually interact with people. And uh, the reason we collaborated was because I think the motto of SDGs is leave no one behind. But if we look at the report, I think the groups which are left behind, they will never get captured in the kind of quantitative data we are generating. So we discussed the evidence uh, that is coming fr from the government reports. Then we tried to put the evidence from the field together. And then we came up with state level reports and which are now being used as uh, we, we are generating policy dialogues around these reports. So that is the work we are doing. Uh, at the same time, since this project is being implemented in se six other countries, like uh, there is Kenya, Senegal, El Salvador, Colombia, India, Indonesia. So that gives us some opportunity to actually represent the kind of work we are doing here at the uh, global level as well. So Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, one of the newest conventions in the United Nations systems. And just going to dive in a little bit into the history because we are also talking about how sexual and reproductive health and rights within this convention work. So um, just while the convention was being negotiated, sexual and reproductive rights were very neatly pulled out and there were member states who did not agree. And this really set the context of how one of uh, you know, one of the most important global sort of human rights document or instrument for people with disabilities, which was really by people with disabilities and member states, et cetera, coming together, would then have this gender SRHR framing. Um, so just to give you an example of we have access to justice, we have, of course, violence, we have um, right to health, and which says a line including sexual health. Um, we have right to family, uh, which says number and spacing of children, and that's it. So very much within the framework of family, very much within the framework of reproduction per se, uh, but the access which is defined uh, in the CRPD is not in the context of, let's say, an access to contraception or to other sexual rights uh, and, and sexual services. Um, it's really not a language of um, access to abortion, let's say. It's more in the language and the framing because of the context that women with disabilities live in, it's more in the context of no forced abortion. So really prevention and protection rather than facilitation and rights. Um, so when we say sexual and reproductive rights, and I think Sai was raising this question saying global and regional, why are they important uh, when there is so much sort of national connect to be made or change really happens at the national level. And so here's a classic example of NCRPD was actually uh, formed and, and nation states ratified it. So India was one of the first countries to um, ratify uh, the UNCRPD and that was very, very la a landmark moment for all of us in the disability rights space or the disability and gender rights space to see how we could translate some of the commitments made at this level into a very progressive law, which we did in 2016. But what did the absence of sexual and reproductive rights um, look like? Uh, it resulted in a law that said that women with severe disabilities could, you could abort, uh, they could undergo abortion without their consent. 
if they live with a severe disability, not otherwise. Um, it also did not outline how it would counter the CARA guidelines which speak about adoption and so uh, women with disabilities were continuously being bar kept away from adoption under the guise of physical and mental fitness. Um, it did not talk about what sexual and reproductive rights would mean when there were clauses like unsoundness of mind. So really a gap in the global mechanism impacted the national laws. So we are um, basically an organization made up entirely of human rights lawyers um, who are also mothers who have experienced or uh, become survivors of um, adverse or abusive maternity health care. And we formed uh, around the... Um, came together basically after the Tarnovsky case in the European Human Rights, uh, Court of Human Rights in 2010. And that was a case where uh, the Court of Human Rights basically uh, said that in addition to the right to health and the right to life, women had the right to decide the circumstances of their birth. One of the things we do, of course, in order to facilitate grassroots action is that we we do put it out there that we will help if um, women come to us. Our most recent engagement was in Mumbai with um, a number of women who came to us talking, complaining about the Janani Suraksha Yojana regime, which um, they said was unnecessarily coercive and was having um, negative outcomes. So for about two years before we ran and hosted a conference in 2017 um, in Mumbai, we did a lot of on-the-ground on research and in India and actually connected with academics who were researching in the field as well. So one of the things we do is we actually spread the information that's coming from the high level um, and we, we engage with women on the ground. So we've got about 150 women's organisations that communicate with us. We've probably got about 180,000 people who've signed up to our Facebook page and who are regularly checking in. And we feed them with information that's going on at the top level and we also give them advice and support them on what their rights are. Make no mistake, every woman that's walking into a facility everywhere on the globe, no matter how rich or poor or educated she is, has absolutely no idea about her human rights. And what happens when these doctors dominate these excuses by saying, you know, um, that it's your fault or it's out of necessity or we have to do this, is that it is a discourse that is normalising the abuse and disrespect and it is directly linked to maternal mortality and infant mortality. And what I did is, is um, I did a big research study on accountability in the local health system in Ghana and I went to look at, um, I tried to analyse the accountability chain from the global level, the national level, up to the local level to understand whether international NGOs had reporting, monitoring and evaluation systems that went, um, whether they knew first uh, uh, whether they were reaching the most vulnerable, yeah? they were saying that in their programs, were they actually aware that they were reaching these and how the accountability worked when you had a complaint, yeah? when a community person who did a service had a complaint, is this going up where, uh, upwards? Uh, are there systems? Um, so I interviewed, um, tried to interview uh, at the global level, people in the, in the, the global offices. Um, I interviewed the national offices and then also at the district level, uh, the representatives from the international NGOs and the local. But what I also saw that was in the local health system, there were, um, I was comparing different types of NGOs. You had the service delivery NGOs, who typically were focusing on family planning, who had a history in population activities. So we were typically starting in the, I think, yeah, 60s, 70s. Then you had those community-based international NGOs, who were more about uh, expanding uh, based on community needs, not only focusing on family planning, uh, just a broader set of services. And then you had uh, in sexual reproductive health research and technical uh, expertise INGOs. And I looked at these three groups. If you looked at the family planning uh, INGOs, they at the time they didn't have uh, a lot of ways for a normal you know, clients at the community level in Ghana to really vouch a complaint. You had at certain organizations patient rights charters 
hanging there. You had telephone numbers, but people at the time in the two districts where I did this kind of research didn't use these kind of levers. What there was, was a sort of horizontal accountability. So the NGOs worked well with the public health system and the public health system worked well with them. Why? Because the public health system also needed these resources from these international NGOs. What I wanted to say there with is that they also had no way, so those district health authorities, the public health system to really enforce accountability from those NGOs because they were in a resource-dependent relationship. For the safe delivery services, uh, the data recently from the Lancet have shown that uh, uh, though there is increase in the SS, uh, the mortality and morbidity has not uh, decreased to that uh, level. So what is more important, access or the quality? Because everybody and everywhere we see that we are more concentrated on the targets, increasing numbers. So, but uh, if we see at the outcome level, then uh, it's uh, not as expected. So uh, which one is uh, more like important, access or the quality? Thank you. I think uh, Bashi just uh, touched on it. Um, so access for uh, to, uh, to to maternal health services for women with disabilities means a whole different gamut. So access, physical access to the space of the hospital, access in terms of um, the medical professionals' openness to sort of deal with it, and then access in terms of just the equipments, the beds, um, so which comes under physical infrastructure, and then access to the kind of support, the medical interventions that you would need as a woman living with quadriplegia and pregnant. So just access becomes multiply um, uh, intersecting. Also, if you look at other intersections like caste, and so when you're talking about women from uh, Dalit Bahujan communities within India, access to mainstream hospitals where maternal health concerns are addressed or, or, or at the time of delivery does not happen because they belong to a certain caste where we're not allowed to these spaces. So just um, access in terms of what gets a little more complicated. Thank you. Thank you.